You ready for the word? Open your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I don't know about you, but I love Charlie Brown. And my favorite all-time Charlie Brown cartoon is this one right here. I don't know if you've seen it before, but Lucy walks into the room. Linus is watching TV, and she says, switch channels. He delays. I said, switch channels. I want to watch my program. Are you kidding? What makes you think you can walk right in here and take over? Lucy says, these five fingers, individually they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Which channel do you want? After a sigh, he says, why can't you guys get organized like that? (laughs) Isn't that true? Isn't that true? As individual followers of Jesus, we have limited potential. But when we come together... As a church, when we bring our individual lives together, unified with one another, we become an entity that can express the fullness of God upon the earth. And we can cause the gates of hell to tremble, and not just tremble, but also to crumble. There is power in a unified Church. I told you last week that the church is essential to your experience of the fullness of God. There are aspects that God wants you to know and experience in life that cannot be experienced apart from a a, a deep abiding relationship with the church. And there's a lot of people out there trying to do Christianity in a churchless environment. Folks, they may experience some of Christ. But they can't experience all of Christ apart from the body, the bride of Christ. So far in the book of Ephesians, we've been seeing that we've been, we've been brought to life individually, spiritually brought to life individually, and we've been brought together corporately so that together we might become this organism that can accomplish God's agenda in this generation. Now, the first three uh, chapters of this book have dealt with with theology. It's dealt with our wealth. We are rich, spiritually rich in Christ. And he's talked about this Fort Knox spiritual account that we have. I mean, we are rich in Christ. But now as he transitions into the second half of the book, we're going to be looking not at our riches, but at our walk. So we've seen our wealth. We're going to now see our walk. Now, what's interesting is that the first issue that he deals with is our relationship. He doesn't talk about our doctrine anymore. He's not talking about our holiness. He's not talking about our gifting. He's not talking about our warfare. He's talking about our relationships, our relationships. He's putting a priority here. A church that's going to be the fullness of Christ upon the earth must have individuals who are deeply committed and connected to one another. Unity is the church's greatest strategy for evangelism. Let me say that again. Unity is the church's greatest strategy for evangelism. We we come up with all kinds of evangelism programs But folks, evangelism programs are powerless. You know what the the real power of a church is? People. It's people. The quality of its people. And the connectivity of those people with one another. Have I ever told you that the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships? Yeah, like a billion times, Pastor. Well, Well, could I add something to that? It would simply be this. The quality of our relationships determines the quantity of our impact. The quality of our relationships determines the quantity of our impact. Doesn't the Bible say that? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 9. You know, it's been estimated that The Revolutionary War here in our country could have been won in one year. In one year, if all the colonies would have been unified. But because the colonies were divided during that time, it took us eight bloody battle years to win our independence. Unity is powerful. 
It's effective. It accomplishes what individuals can't. I read the story of a young girl who wandered out into the cold of uh, the countryside of Canada. And uh, the family realized she was lost. And so they began looking for her and searching for her. And realized they couldn't find her. So they called the people around and said, would you help us look for our daughter? And everybody went in different directions looking for the little girl. And no one could find her. And it got darker and darker. And the, the cold Canadian winter was setting in. And people realized this is, this is a desperate situation. Finally, someone said, well, let's, let's join hands and let's stretch out across this field and we'll walk one by one all the way across. And they did. And sure enough, they found her. But it was too late. Her cold, lifeless body lay there in the grass. Someone shouted, if only we had joined hands sooner. Folks, what needs to be accomplished can't be accomplished alone. We've got to join hands together. We've got to come together so that we can become what God has called us to be. So now, as Paul is transitioning from the doctrinal to the practical, he urges us to walk worthy of our calling. The value that we place upon our calling in Christ is first seen in the value we place upon each other. Now, let that sink in. Is your salvation very valuable to you? Well, you will express the value of your salvation, the worth of your salvation, by how you treat the people around you, the church. He says, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner Worthy, a work, walk in a manner that's valuable, that expresses the value of your salvation that you've been called with. Verse 2 With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He says, Eager to maintain the unity. Have you noticed how unity requires maintenance? Unity requires maintenance. Unity requires protection. Things don't stay unified without care. Can I get a witness? <laughs> it just doesn't stay that way. Why? Why can't we just be unified all the time? Why, doesn't, why don't things just stay harmonious? Well, the answer is simple. There is an unseen enemy of our souls. There's an unseen enemy that is bent on destroying harmony, destroying fellowship, destroying relationship. Satan knows that our greatest asset is unity. Therefore, our greatest demise is disunity. And so he's constantly seeking to drive wedges into every relationship of life. He'll seek a way to divide uh, uh, you from your, your friends, from your family, from your spouse, from your church, from your, your Sunday school leader, from your, your pastor. You realize that. He's constantly sowing seeds of division. You got to be aware of that. An unseen enemy who sows discord. If he can divide us, he knows he can neutralize us. Most churches today are neutralized. Why? Because they're divided. Lee Iacocca, the business tycoon, once said, a major reason capable people fail to advance is that they don't work well with their colleagues. Now, we can Christianize that, can't we? A major reason capable churches fail to advance is that they don't get, they don't work well with each other. Most churches spend way too much time in conflict. And so long as we're fighting with each other, we can't fight the enemy. One of the primary keys to this congregation has been her unity through the years. We've continued to move forward because we have learned how to keep the unity in the bonds of peace. Unity is a high priority around here. We're constantly focusing on that. Paul says... 
be eager to maintain, or as the New International Version says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Folks, that's true everywhere. You need to be making every effort to keep unity in the bonds of peace. Now, now how, do you, how do you do that? How do you do that? In this passage, we find four characteristics. I'm going to call them four characteristics of gregarious people. I love that word. You like that word, gregarious? I like the word gregarious. If you look in the dictionary, it means living in herds or flocks or growing in clusters. Okay, it doesn't mean we're supposed to be cows and, and grapes. You know, it means that we are to be fond of the company of others. Fond of the company of others. Are you fond of the company of others? Come on. Are you really? Are you fond of the company? Some of you are like, nope, I am an introvert. I don't like people. You know, I get that. I get that. I'm an introvert. I know I act like an extrovert, but really I'm an introvert. I'd much rather be by myself so long as Lisa's close by. But, you know, I just like that. That's how, that's how I nourish, okay? But I've learned to be an extrovert, and I've learned to be fond of people. I've learned that every person is just this, this wealth of value if I'll just dig a little bit. Okay, some people you got to dig a lot of, but, but it's there. And you got to be fond of people. Now, Paul's going to give us four characteristics. And I hope you'll, you'll realize these characteristics need to be born out in your life. Maybe you need to post these somewhere in your life so you're constantly asking, am I this? Am I this? Am I this? Am I this? Okay, here they are. Number one is humility. Gregarious people are, are humble people. Now, humility is simply thinking correctly about yourself. Not too highly. Not too lowly. It's refusing to give way to the sinful flesh that's always wanting to peg people. Okay? It, you know, I don't know about you, but my sinful flesh has a tendency to look at a person, size them up, and either put them even above or below me. Am I the only one that has a sinful flesh? Come on, you're that way too. Every person you meet, the sinful flesh is right there saying, size them up. You better than them? They better than you? Yeah, about even. Now that's sinful. That is sinful as sinful can be. And that's the kind of thought that we have to take captive and make it obedient unto Christ. We empty ourselves of that kind of mindset. You see, Jesus, he was socially blind. He didn't see rich, he didn't see poor, he didn't see powerful, he didn't see weak, he didn't see beautiful, he didn't see ugly. He just saw people in need of a Savior. And so he emptied himself so he could connect with anyone and everyone. That's the root of humility. It's emptying yourself of your position, of your privilege, of your pride, so that you can connect with anyone and everyone. Whether they be rich, poor, pretty, ugly. A highly gregarious church, a highly gregarious believer is a person who takes captive every temptation that thinks that they might be better than another. How are you doing with that? Is that a constant discipline in your life? Are you constantly reigning in the flesh saying, I will not? elevate myself above, nor will I delegate myself below anyone else. I am of value. They are of value. We're both created in the image of God and loved by God. Humility. Number two is gentleness. He says gentleness. Gentleness is, is strength under control. It's having the power and position to break, but instead using it to build and to protect. It's realizing the fragility of people. People are fragile. They're fragile. People break. People are easily hurt. Whether you have thick skin or thin skin, you're breakable. You're hurtable. Everyone is. 
When we think of gentleness, when I think of gentleness, I, I think immediately of King Kong and Naomi Watts. <laughs> Isn't that what you think of? Here, he could crush her if he wanted to, but instead, what is he? He's careful, careful. You know, basketball in my neighborhood growing up, it was no blood, no foul. Remember playing that way? No blood, no foul. I mean, you just played hard, elbows flew, I mean, scratching, I mean, it didn't matter. You know, you can knock them down, you can tackle them if you want to, just so long as you didn't draw blood. And if you were a, you know, sissy, you called a foul, and you couldn't show the blood, you know, what, what's that? Yeah, that's fine in sand like basketball. But when it comes to real life, can't play that way. We got to be careful with each other. Careful. So, humility, gentleness, and then, then he says patience. Patience is determination to remain positive regardless of the negative you see in another. It's determining, I'm going to remain positive even though I want to go negative, regardless of the negative I see in another person. It's remaining neutral when you want to go ballistic. That ever happened to you? It happens to me on a regular basis. Now, other translations would translate the word long-suffering. Patience is the willingness to suffer the annoyances of another for a long time. A long time without giving them a piece of your mind and without avoiding them at all costs. You know, we're all porcupines. You realize that, right? You got pokey points. I got pokey points. I mean, and the closer Brian and I get, the more we poke each other. And so Brian and I have, we have to get close real careful, okay? And, and that's, that's what patience is all about, putting up with the pokey points of others. And a church that's going to be unified has got to do that. You know why? Because we all still have this thing, this, this residual thing called the sinful flesh. And I'm going to have pokey points until the day I'm glorified. And so are you. And therefore, in the life of the church, we've got to constantly practice long suffering. We, we were celebrating in the first service, Paul and Jan Miller they, this week, have been married for 70 years. Can you imagine that? 70 years of marriage. Now, Jan and Paul have been in our church since the day it was born, 1964. Uh, I was one year old at that time. I wasn't even born when they got married. I mean, I mean they've been married a long time. And, and if you know Paul, you know that Jan has had to be patient, <laughs> you know, Paul's got pokey points. No, not really. He's a great guy. But you know, in your marriage, you know, the key to a happy marriage is learning how to be patient with each other, regardless of the fact that both of you still have a sinful flesh. And sometimes that sinful flesh just comes out. Patience. And number four is love. Love. This is not erotic, physical love. This is not reciprocal phileo love. This is unidirectional love, okay? It's agape love. It's the love that goes in one direction. It's the kind of love that God has that loves people whether they're lovable or not. Whether they reciprocate that love or not. It's a love that is based upon who you are, not who they are. Now, that's the kind of love that God is trying to to produce in you. A love that's based simply upon who you are in Christ. Not who they are, but who you are. This is the kind of love that God wants growing inside of you. Other kinds of love, they're natural. Erotic love or eros love, that's, that's natural. It just happens. Phileo love, when someone loves you, it's natural to love them in return. But agape love, unidirectional love, a love that loves when no love is returned. A love that loves when there's nothing lovable to love. That's supernatural. That's the kind of love that God, by His Spirit, is trying to produce in you. Okay, you show me a church where humility and gentleness and patience and love is the foundation. And I'll show you a church 
that is changing lives. That can't, kind of environment, it can't help but change lives. So the question is, is, is that the kind of church that we have? Are we a gregarious church? Are we growing in that way? Are we fond of people, of all people? Are we humble? Humble enough to jettison our positions and privilege so that we might connect with anyone and everyone. Gentle, so that we know that people are fragile. We've got to be careful. Sure, we can kid around, and I love to kid around, you know that, but we've got to be careful and make sure that coarse jesting doesn't begin to take place. We've got to be patient. People are always going to annoy you. I'm going to annoy you. Ask my wife. You know, it just happens, but we have to give ourselves enough uh, grace that we're long-suffering with the annoyances of others. And we've got to learn how to practice this unidirectional love. That kind of environment will change a person. It doesn't matter whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. You're being called by God to be gregarious. I was reading of a man who visited 18 different churches in successive Sundays. He wanted to find out if these churches really were fond of people, if they liked people, if they wanted people. He said, I went, I sat near the front after the service. I walked slowly to the rear. Then I returned to the front, went back to the foyer using another aisle. I smiled. I was neatly dressed. I asked one person to direct me to a specific place, a fellowship hall, Sunday school class, pastor study, etc., I remained for coffee if it was served. I used a scale to rate the reception. I awarded points on the following basis. Ten points for a smile from a worshiper. Ten points for a greeting from someone sitting nearby me. One hundred points for an exchange of names. Two hundred points for an invitation to have coffee. Two hundred points for an invitation to return. 1,000 points for an introduction to another worshiper. 2,000 for an invitation to, the, to meet the pastor. He says, on this scale, 11 of the 18 churches that he visited earned less than 100 points. Huh. Five actually received less than 20 points. The doctrine may be biblical, he writes, the singing inspirational, the sermon uplifting. But when a person finds nobody who cares whether he's there, he's not likely to come back. Folks, it really doesn't matter how good of a preacher I am or how great a worship team we have leading worship. People are going to come because they connect with people. You are our greatest asset. You are the strategy of God. People who are gregarious, people who are fond of others, who reach out and connect with others, that's what makes the difference. Now, in verses 4 through 6, having addressed these four essential practices of a gregarious church, Paul reminds us of our doctrinal unity. Let me look at this real quickly with you. Verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Now, did you get them all? We're all part of the same body. We all share the same Holy Spirit. We're all going to be raptured at the same time. That's our hope. We all have the same Lord. His name is Jesus. We all share the same faith. That's Jesus. He lived, he died, he rose, and he's coming back. We've all been baptized or immersed into the same universal church. We have all have the same God who is all our Father, who is over all, through all, in, in all. Folks, look around. We're all identical twins. I mean, we have more in common than we have uncommon. And folks, whatever, what the problem is, is when we get focused upon what we don't have in common, that we lose sight of what we do have in common. And these seven unifying facts should overwhelm any diversifying truths that are present. 
Folks, we got to stay focused upon how we are alike, not on how we're different. During vacation Bible school, a class was interrupted pretty near the end of the class. And a little boy was ushered in, adding this little boy to the class. This little boy was different. He was missing his left arm. Now, the teacher was right in the middle of her class, and so she didn't have time to find out the state of the boy, what happened, how he was in his adjustment to the situation. And and so she just kind of hoped nobody would say anything. Nobody would upset the little boy. And so it went on into the class, and everything continued, and nothing was said. And and, and she was so excited that everything was going so well, and and the little boy was going to make it to the end and not be offended. And she said, okay, boys and girls, let's close that class the way we always do. Let's all get our churches ready. Okay, here's the church, and here's the steeple. Open. At that moment, she realized what she feared the children would do. She just did. How could he make the church with one arm? It's in that moment of silence, a little girl turned to Davy and said, Hey, Davy, let's make the church together. And she intertwined her fingers into his fingers and said, Here's the church and here's the steeple. Let's open the door and there's all the people. You know, if you'll take your handicapped life and I'll take my handicapped life and we'll intertwine our lives together, we can become the church that expresses the fullness of Christ in this generation. Pray with me. Father, we want to be the church that expresses the fullness of Christ upon the earth. Lord, we know that there are countless thousands of people all around us who need the message of Christ. And Lord, our unity is our strategy. You said that they would know that we're your disciples by the love that we have for each other. Lord, teach us how to love one another, how to be gentle and patient and humble and kind. Father, I pray that in the days ahead, we would see a greater attraction to this congregation. Lord, help us all to develop a fondness for people. Lord, help us not to focus upon how they're different than us. Help us not to get fixated upon what annoys us about people. Lord, help us to look beneath the surface to the inherent value of every person created in your image loved by you, died for by Jesus, and desirous of you for eternity. Lord, help us to be that kind of a church. We love you, Lord Jesus. Receive now your praise we offer up. Amen. Let's stand together.